Yes. All right, we'll kick things off. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine here at Washington University School of Medicine. It is a real pleasure to have you join us for a new addition to our Grand Round series, the inaugural Marvin E. Levin MD Visiting Lectureship. As always, I will assist with moderating the chat with our speaker if time allows. But before I introduce today's speaker, please help me welcome Dr. Frazier, the Chair of Medicine, to tell us more about Dr. Levin. Good morning. It's good to see the people here in the audience. I'm thrilled you're here. And also, uh, I understand we have a large online presence this morning, so welcome. I wanted to say a little bit about Dr. Marvin Levin, who is a beloved, distinguished former faculty member of Washington University, who unfortunately passed away in uh, 2016 at the age of 91. So um, Marvin was born in um, Indiana, actually moved to St. Louis when he was about seven years old and, and so grew up here and then um, was served in World War II as a medical assistant, which I think spurred his interest in going to medical school. So after World War II, he came back to St. Louis, went to uh, Washington University for undergrad and then Washington University for medical school and did his residency in endocrine training here at Barnes Hospital. As I said, he was a beloved faculty member. He was well known for being an outstanding clinician who focused on diabetes care and particularly the care of the diabetic foot. He was passionate about the prevention of diabetic foot ulcers and amputations and authored one of the first books in uh, endocrinology focused totally on uh, diabetic foot management. And that book continues uh, to this day. He attended um, uh, in the fellows clinic for many years and was known as an outstanding teacher and also a bit of a jokester. So both his patients and all of the faculty and trainees that knew him always knew that, that Dr. Levin had some funny jokes to go along with all of his good clinical science that he presented. He received a number of honors and awards for his scholarship, including awards for the American Diabetes Association. Um, he established um, the Council for Diabetic Foot Care and the um, American Diabetes Association won their Distinguished Clinician Award and also won an Outstanding Alumni Award from Washington University. They, he and his wife, Barbara, previously established a visiting professorship in endocrinology which is a wonderful gift and testimony to um, their commitment to the university and to education. Um, Dr. Levin was also very active in the community and uh, was a member and former president of Congregation B'nai L in uh, West County, where he served also um, as a member of the Anti-Defamation League. So his commitment to Judaism and to um, equity is well-renowned. He um, was married to Barbara and, and Barbara hopefully is with us on online and some of their kids. So I think they uh, were married for at least 40 years at the time that Dr. Levin passed away. They have three kids, um, uh, Jennifer, Lynn and Michael. And at the time, I think they had three grandkids, hopefully with the baby boom and COVID, they have more grandchildren, which is always a blessing. So it's a real privilege and we are very grateful um, to the Levin family for allowing us to recognize Dr. Levin in this way. So now I'll turn it back to Dr. John Hickman, our really um, terrific chief resident who's gonna introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier. Uh, it is a true honor to welcome our first Marvin E. Levin visiting lecturer, Dr. Kathleen Cooney. Dr. Cooney is the George Barth Geller Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Medicine at Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, North Carolina. Oh, this woman is the Chair of the Department of Medicine? Oh, no wonder. Thank you, Mark. Uh, she received her MD from the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine and completed her training in internal medicine and heme onc at the University of Michigan. She was recruited to Duke in 2018, where she has guided research and clinical missions, She's recruited new leaders and demonstrated a strong commitment to addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Cooney is a medical oncologist focused on caring for men with prostate cancer and internationally known for investigations examining the genetic epidemiology of prostate cancer. She's discovered a recurrent mutation in the HOXP13 gene that increases the risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. She is the epitome of the physician scientist, an excellent educator, perfectly in keeping with Dr. Levin's legacy. 
Dr. Levin's wife, as you mentioned, Barbara Levin and several family members aren't able to attend. I think they're at a family wedding out of state, but they are joining us via Zoom. I want to echo Dr. Fraser and the department's thanks to them for their generous contributions. And on behalf of them and us, please help me welcome Dr. Kathleen Cooney. Thank you very much, John, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, and thank you, Dr. Fraser, for the kind invitation. And I'd also like to pay my respects to Dr. Levin and his family and thank the family for this very generous gift. Um, development's really important in the sustainability of academic medicine. And so um, this is greatly appreciated. I have to say something about that? No financial support. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, my title today is Hereditary Prostate Cancer from Gene Discovery to Clinical Implementation. So hopefully there's something in this talk for everyone. If you're a lab scientist or a clinician, something to, uh, you know, to, to wrap your head around. And I have uh, no disclosures to report. Here are the educational goals. So every year, um, those of us who are medical oncologists look for this slide. Um, it appears in the journal CA, a, a cancer journal for clinicians, and it is the American Cancer Society's attempt at estimating the number of cancers that we can expect in a given year, uh, separated by men and women. And so it's important to recognize that prostate cancer is the number one most common cancer in men, with about 27% of all cancers in the U.S. Uh, in men die, are, are prostate cancer. Also importantly, uh, you know, we talk a lot about should we screen for prostate cancer and is prostate cancer just there or is it really a, an important disease? It is the second most lethal uh, cancer in the US after lung cancer. And so hopefully I'll help um, in this presentation today help you understand how to separate types of prostate cancer and why it's such a uh, complex disease. There are three important risk factors for prostate cancer. Age is one of the most important. Prostate cancer is rarely seen in men under age 40, and then rapidly increases in incidence over age. The average age of prostate cancer diagnosis in the US today is about 66. And you can see we diagnose prostate cancer cases all the way into men in their 90s. Um, importantly, as it relates to um, genetics, um, if people have a mutation that increases the risk of a disease, it's often that they'll get the disease earlier. So we often focus on cases in men 55 and under as potentially signals that someone might have an inherited uh, susceptibility gene. The second most important uh, risk factor for prostate cancer is race and ethnicity. If you look across the globe, there's huge variation in incidence of prostate cancer throughout the world. Within the United States, it's African-Americans that have the highest uh, risk of prostate cancer. Um, and if you look on the bottom part of the slide, they also have the highest mortality. There's been a tremendous amount of research um, done in the United States looking to try to understand that. And as you can imagine, in internal medicine, it's likely multifactorial and very complex. And uh, we'll reflect a little bit about this um, as we talk about genetics today. For the first time, the American Cancer Society actually replicated the um, incidence of cancers in men and women of Black or African uh, race within the U.S. And I think this is, again, an important statement that we really need to think about how diseases affect populations differently in our country. And I think as it relates to prostate cancer, there's um, a higher incidence overall. So you can see that uh, Black men, 37% of all cancers diagnosed in Black men in this year will be prostate cancer. So really much more common if, you know, if it's 27% it's overall, this is a really important disease to be considering when you're evaluating uh, men of African race. And then similarly, um, it has a much more important impact on mortality. So 17% of deaths from, from cancer in black men in the US this year will be prostate cancer. Again, much higher than overall. So again, as you're evaluating people, race is really an important thing to be considering when you're thinking about prostate cancer risk. And we'll spend most of our time today talking about family history. I've spent most of my career working in this area. This is actually a family from uh, my research project that I ran at Michigan for many years. Um, the proband indicated by the arrow was a gentleman I evaluated for castrate resistant prostate cancer back in the Ann Arbor VA when I was a junior faculty member. And I remember being so struck by his family history as we're talking about his back pain from his bony metastases. I was so struck by the fact that he told me he had four brothers with prostate cancer, including one who had recently died in Chicago. His father died of prostate cancer. He had two uncles affected who died of the disease. And then interestingly, on the right-hand part of the slide, you can see that 
that uncle had two marriages and had men with prostate cancer in each of sons with prostate cancer in each of those marriages. So if you can imagine that this family had a, a prostate cancer gene, you can account for all of those cases by a single gene that would be transmitted um, in that family. So back in the early 90s, many of us were seeing these families and set up programs to try to do linkage analysis to understand, could we identify a gene that increases the risk of prostate cancer? We used to call it PRCA, like just like breast cancer, BRCA1, that this would be PRCA1. Unfortunately, the story is a lot more complicated. Um, before we get to linkage analysis, I just want to talk about the importance of family history. So um, it's an interesting to think about what is the mode of inheritance for a potential prostate cancer gene. The early studies of large pedigree suggested that um, the most likely explanation was it one or more rare autosomal dominant genes that would account for hereditary prostate cancer. But if you call through all of the literature, there's also evidence for both recessive and X-linked models. It's important when you look at um, families with prostate cancer to look at the number of affected individuals in a pedigree, which is again, biased by the fact of, do you have a lot of brothers so that you can see if there's a disease within the family. But we know that the more individuals affected with prostate cancer, the higher the risk for an individual. And we also know that uh, having men who are first degree relatives is more important than second degree relatives. So again, closeness to that individual. As I discussed earlier, early onset prostate cancer is also a signal for a potential genetic uh, contribution to the disease. And then um, looking for other cancer types in the pedigrees, because as you'll see later on, prostate cancer more recently has been implicated in some known cancer syndromes like hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and Lynch syndrome. Um, I, th I will scatter um, some of our research um, in this area throughout the presentation and um, the pipetman's a reminder for me to tell you anything that's in blue is something that either came from our laboratory or members of our laboratory were important contributors to um, various uh, pieces. Um, before I got to Duke, I spent two years as the chair of medicine at the University of Utah. And um, I always like to dive in at new organizations now and try to figure out like what's new and what's exciting and different in an organization that I can take advantage of. Um, I think many of you know at Utah, there's a strong emphasis on family and there's a wonderful database called the Utah Population Database, which is supported by the Mormon church. And um, it's a registry of families and it's extensive. And what's in research, it's also linked to the Utah Cancer Registry. So you have both very accurate family history information and very accurate cancer um, data. So we did a very large study that took multiple years, we actually published it after I left Utah, where we looked at individuals with different family histories and tried to estimate their risk based on family history. And what we used are three definitions that are often used in our field. So on the, you know, pedigree A is an individual with three um, first degree family members with prostate cancer. B is an individual with prostate cancer in three generations. C is two men in a pedigree with early onset disease. What's remarkable in this, when you have really good family history information and accurate cancer information, you can see all of these um, family history uh, descriptions increase the risk of uh, prostate cancer for that individual. More importantly, it also increases the risk of lethal prostate cancer, so not just incident, but you know, lethal cancer. And then we thought it was really cool, pedigree A and pedigree structure C have a, almost an eight or ninefold chance of that, that person having early onset disease. So again, we often struggle in clinic, you know, like getting a family history, people don't know, they don't have that information. But the point of this slide is to tell you that it really is important. So if we can get better family history information and cancer diagnostic information, um, that's going to be a win for us doing risk assessment. And then lastly, there's lots and lots of evidence suggesting that prostate cancer is heritable, meaning there's a genetic underpinning to the disease. And this is just one example of many. Um, this is data from the Nordic Twin Study published by Laura Lee Mucci back in, in JAMA in 2016. Um, when you're trying to understand um, with, in a twin study if there's a genetic underpinning is you're looking at the concordance of whatever disease, in this case, cancer, between monozygotic or identical twins and dizygotic twins, which are fraternal twins. And in this study, you can see heritability is the likelihood of the there's a genetic component contributing to the phenotype. And so for all cancers, it's 33%. So, you know, 33% of the concordance of disease in monozygotic twins is due to genetics. In prostate cancer and in melanoma, it's twice that. So again, very strong evidence that there's a genetic underpinning to prostate cancer. 
It's also interesting in this study, they had some environmental data and there's really very little or zero evidence that environmental factors contribute to this, um, uh, to, to prostate cancer. And this is quite different than breast cancer and colon cancer, both diseases where we know the genes that underlie it. Um, and there you see that a pretty equal contribution between uh, genetic contributions in shared environment. So again, um, just data that says that we were pretty, um, should have been on the right path at looking for genes that increase the risk of prostate cancer. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about family-based linkage studies. Again, this is a lot of work done in the 90s and early 2000s. So um, as a junior faculty member, um, I was encouraged to um, create my own resource at Michigan. And so with a lot of help from uh, the Department of Urology and the Cancer Center, um, I led a study that we called the U of M Prostate Cancer Genetics Project. At the time, um, I don't, Dr. Fraser and I might remember this era, there was a lot of national press about prostate cancer running in families. There were large collections at Johns Hopkins and um, out in Seattle led by Lee Hood. And a lot of that work was done through magazines and the internet, which was kind of in early days. And so we decided to do a very different approach, which was a clinic-based approach. And we used um, methods that were quite different. We did sip pair analyses. So we really focused on smaller pedigrees that had more affected individuals. And because I'm a medical oncologist, I was looking all the time for men with advanced disease. We uh, collected family history information, medical history information, germline DNA, and when appropriate, we created a tumor bank. Um, at the time I closed the study in 2016, when I left, we had over 4,000 participants, largely men with prostate cancer. And I've been fortunate to carry the same data set to Utah and now to do for continued research. This was the result of our first genome-wide linkage scan. And um, we, um, this is the major signal that we found, which was on the long arm of chromosome 17. And you can see we did, you know, relatively small collection of families, 175. And we did a number of subset analyses to try to pull out different signals. So families with more affected, uh, families with early onset disease, et cetera. Um, what was exciting about this, I think two things. One was, this was a pretty large signal. Um, when we published this in 2003, it was in a journal, uh, Prostate, and was published with seven other genome-wide linkage scans from other institutions. One, this was a bigger signal than most people saw. On the bad side, no one else saw a signal on chromosome 17 like this. And then lastly, a potential good candidate gene was right in the middle of our linkage signal, which is BRCA1, which causes um, and is associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. The first thing that we had to do was exclude BRCA1 um, as our candidate gene. And um, this is so dated, like this is before next gen sequencing. And so we did, it, we actually excluded mutations through um, denaturing HPLC and then uh, Sanger sequencing. So methods that we just don't do anymore it was very labor intensive. And we were fortunate to collaborate with um, investigators at University of Washington for this. Um, so we sequenced uh, 93 probands in, um, in linked families, and we only identified one pathogenic BRCA1 mutation in all of those pedigrees. So we, using this data, essentially excluded BRCA1 as our candidate gene because there simply were not enough mutations to explain our linkage signal. When we set up our genome-wide linkage studies, we were fortunate to collaborate with Jeff Trent, who was then at NHGRI. He helped fund part of the early um, parts of our studies. And we were uh, set up to potentially uh, put all our data sets together. And that was sort of how, um, how I got started in the field. And so I'm very grateful to the NIH and NHGRI for that support. Um, so this first top paper, we put our linkage scan together with a similar scan from John Hop Hopkins, Finland, and Sweden. And interestingly, when you put all four data sets together, the signal on 17Q remained, which increases the likelihood it's real because it wasn't diluted out by um, the other uh, data sets. We went on and then participated in what's been called the ICPCG, which was again, a, 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 a NCI and NHGRI funded project for probably 15 years, which included multiple investigators from throughout the world who we would get together and do research um, studies. We'd collaborate and put together large data sets. So this is the first really large combined genome-wide linkage scan published in 2005. Um, with you know 12 over 1200 families collected throughout the world and again 70q21 so it's 2122 remains so again suggesting that there's a prostate cancer gene in that region um 
the way our linkage consortium worked was people just, uh, it was organic. People sort of divided up and worked with people they wanted to work with. So um, we are fortunate, uh, Bill Isaacs, who led the work at Johns Hopkins was um, part of our SPOR program at Michigan. And so um, he agree graciously agreed to put their um, families in with our Michigan families to do a combined uh, linkage analysis. And so this is a fine mapping project that we did with uh, Johns Hopkins using over 400 families. And without getting into a lot of details, the really important part of this is if you restrict the families to those that seem most genetic, so the 147 families with four more cases in them and evidence of early onset disease, we got a LOD score of five. So remember, a LOD score of three is, is generally what's considered significant. This is the largest, highest LOD score ever in hereditary prostate cancer research. And this sort of pushed us on to continue to, to try to find a gene in this region. Um, again, very grateful for a lot of support. So we had an R01 that was funding this work at the time. And um, I approached our um, program officer and said, you know, I'm really interested. Next generation sequencing was just on the, on the you know, just coming into uh, fruition. And um, I thought it was a really good idea to um, go in and try to sequence our candidate uh, gene interval. This is like old school. <laughs> like if you heard this now, people say like, oh, we do this all the time. But back in, you know, 2000, it was like 2010 or 11, this was like really cutting edge. Um, so we collaborated uh, with Jeff Trent's group, TGen, John Carpton was the lead um, using rain dance technology and um, sequenced all of the candidate genes in the 15 uh, megabase target region on chromosome 17 in 94 uh, prostate cancer families that appeared to be linked to this region. Um, so those of you who do lab science, it's a, a plate of people <laughs> and, and do controls. Um, so that was sort of how, you know, how we uh, collected and decided to do this work. I'm gonna to jump to the punchline because I think it's easier and then we'll go back to see why this finding was important. So what we reported was um, the presence of germline mutations in HOXB13 um, and uh, supporting evidence for increased risk of prostate cancer. So this was a recurrent mutation um, it, and it's non-conservative. So again, more likely to be pathogenic um, in amino acid 84 and the homeobox transcription factor of HOXB13. So those of you who are biologists know that these genes are important in development. Um, this gene is important in, in uh, prostate cancer development, and it's generally very conserved. These are small genes and generally very conserved, so this was a bit of an unusual finding. These are the four pedigrees that got us to this finding. So, um, you know, one huge pedigree from Johns Hopkins, and you can see the Michigan families tend to be a bit smaller. Again, that was our approach, and we were trying to provide sort of a different type of approach to, to um, gene discovery um, by, you know, smaller families, but more advanced disease. And um, some striking things about that. So the arrows indicate the probands. So all four probands had the same mutation, which was unusual. Um, if you look, we did anonymize these pedigrees a bit and we round off the ages, but you can see the age of onset of disease is, is a really strikingly young. Um, another thing that was interesting was all the affected um, with prostate cancer, the black boxes, the plus means that um, they were all, they had a, the G84E mutation. So every affected individual in all four of these pedigrees who um, we could sequence share the mutation. Again, an amazing finding <laughs> given how hard linkage studies were in prostate cancer. And then lastly, there was not a lot of evidence for other cancers in these pedigrees. So um, again, very fortunate to be in an institution with a prostate cancer spore because we had a, a lot, very huge data repositories as is Johns Hopkins. And so Bill and I you know, created a TACMAN assay and we genotyped like every single case of prostate cancer that we could get our hands on. And we also, Hopkins had some control um, uh, in, uh, DNAs from uh, men who had been screened and did not have prostate cancer. So what you can see is the following. So if you take controls, men without prostate cancer, there was only one person with that Hox, uh, Hox uh, B13 mutation. So that um, only 0.1% of men had that mutation. Unrelated cases, it goes up to 1.4%. Uh, men with early onset prostate cancer, 2.2. Uh, positive family history, 2.2. And then if you had both, so the 33, um, you know, amongst the, you know, over 1,000 men that we had who had early onset disease and a positive family history, 33 men had the mutation or 3.1%. So this also was very suggestive that this is important in hereditary prostate cancer and early onset disease. 
Um, we have sequenced this gene in many, many individuals, and this is, you know, this was at the time of publication uh, about 10 years ago. Um, there are other mutations that have been identified in the HoxB13 gene. Again, the gene is relatively small, and you know, there's two active parts of the molecule, the homeodomain, which binds to DNA. There have been mutations identified there. Um, on the left-hand part of the side, you see the G84E mutation, and this is in the part of the, um, of the molecule called the MIS interacting domain, so again, functionally important um, and has led and spurred a lot of uh, biologic studies to understand what these mutations are doing. Um, since publication, there have been many, many confirmatory studies done throughout the world. Um, and this is a meta-analysis most recently done in 2016, uh, confirming that these mutations are important in uh, prostate cancer. The odds ratio of prostate cancer overall is 3.38 um, with a fairly tight confidence interval. If you go and read all the individual studies, there's lots of evidence in all of the studies for early onset disease, multiple affected relatives, the, is, the issue around aggressive disease is complicated. Um, my interpretation is that you see the full spectrum of from low risk to, to aggressive disease, um, but that's been variable by study. And there's some evidence that these mutations may increase the risk of other cancers. The most of the evidence is that this is a prostate cancer specific mutation. If you look overall, um, about 5% of hereditary um, prostate cancer can be attributed to this mutation. Um, it's generally found in white or men of European origin. And if you look at the worldwide data, it's because there's a founder allele. This mutation actually occurs, occurs on a common haplotype um, and probably arose in sort of the Nordic areas, the best we can tell, because that, in that part of the world, the mutation rate is higher. So what's been interesting to me over the last couple, uh, probably five years, again, you know, next generation sequencing, everybody sequencing, you know, genomes and germlines of lots of people. Um, if, if you look in the Nordic countries, as I said, the G84E mutation is very, very common and very strongly associated with prostate cancer. Recent reports in China show that there's a population specific mutation in the same yeast binding domains, um, but in this different area. So it's the G135E mutation. And then in Japan, there's a G132E mutation. So again, all in important um, parts of the molecule, but population specific, which I think is really very interesting. And each of these mutations is, is associated with, with like a two to three fold increased risk of prostate cancer. Um, work by my uh, friend and collaborator, Scott Tomlins, who is a, a wonderful geopathologist. Uh, we went out and we collected as many cases of, of uh, prostate cancer occurring in men with G84E mutation as we can find. Um, and what uh, their group described is pseudo hyperplastic features with these dilated glands and the pink amorphous secretions. Um, and then we in prostate cancer have been doing a lot of work trying to understand the molecular phenotypes of prostate cancer. And um, again, without getting in too much detail, ERG, 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 trans ERG, ERG translocations occur in about half of prostate cancer and G84E mutations you don't see that very commonly. And there's more cases with spink overexpression, which is relatively rare. So it seems like these cancers may have a distinct molecular phenotype. So what I just shared with you is about a 15 year story about trying to find a gene that's associated with prostate cancer on the long arm of chromosome 17. The story actually starts even before that. Um, our lab, other laboratories, um, was able to show that there was um, evidence for a tumor suppressor near BRCA1 in prostate cancer. So this has been a very long story. And the reason I put all of this up is because during the same time, there have been many, many linkage analyses, many, many genes proposed. And this HOXB13 mutation really is the only thing that has really come from linkage studies, despite a tremendous amount of work. So what was the problem? Um, I think that when most of these studies were done, I think many of you know, in around 1990, PSA was brought into the world um, as a method for detecting um, prostate cancer. Um, I don't want to talk, spend a lot of time talking about PSA screening and detection, but I think many of us know that PSA is not a prostate cancer specific marker. It um, is elevated by many other conditions and often um, can find low risk prostate cancers that may not be clinically um, relevant. And so when many of these studies were done, we really didn't look at the type of prostate cancer and there was an abundance of low risk disease being diagnosed. Um, prostate cancer was known to run in families. So there was also a push toward if you had, a, 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 you know, if you had prostate cancer, you should go tell your families to get that, you know, screened. So I, we believe that, and there's some evidence that just this, uh, this abundance of, of detection of early onset diseases and lots of family history 
looking at and finding a lot of low risk cancers that may not be genetically driven, um, maybe confuse some of our linkage analyses. So I'm gonna switch our topic now. We're gonna to move to the other end of the spectrum, which is advanced disease and talk about how tumor sequencing led to um, new revelations ar around our thinking about germline mutations and prostate cancer. So um, this is a slide from one of our former fellows now at Ohio State, Smit Rochowdry, um, just showing how the Michigan Tumor Board works. I know Rashi has a tumor board like this. I think everyone does, particularly in academic medicine. Um, you know, basically there was a drive in the kind of like 2010 and beyond to really, um, we had next generation sequencing, we could biopsy tumors. And if we could understand what were the driver mutations, we could make better treatments and be more um, specific. So this is sort of the beginning of precision oncology. Um, basically what you wanna do is, um, you know, find um, the tumor, get a good sample of tumor at Michigan, um, this was from our research program where we also um, collected germline DNA so we could separate out what was a tumor specific mutation from what was actually in germline. Um, we had a very large tumor sequencing um, tumor board and then disclosure of results was done by, if it was somatic by the medical oncology team, if it was germline by our genetic counselors. So this is Madison Grand Rounds. We have to have a little mini case. So um, this is a 55-year-old uh, man with fatigue and back pain, probably a, a presentation you might have seen on the wards. Um, the patient had anemia and a PSA of greater than 100, and this is his bone scan. And you can see most many, many osteoblastic metastases dominant in the spine as well as the ribs. Um, this patient also had nodal disease, and this is a uh, node uh, aspirate showing um, the, what the, you know, it's a very aggressive uh, prostate cancer, you know, high grade. And um, when the molecular studies came back, there was a tempest 2 erg uh, translocation. And then the patient was found to have a somatic and a germline BRCA2 mutation. At the time, this is a real case um, cared for by one of my colleagues. And I think we were very surprised at this finding. And this was new because people were starting to see germline BRCA2 mutations when they didn't expect it. Um, this was the patient's family history. Again, no one really took it until after the fact. And so this is the patient with early onset prostate cancer. Um, the patient on further um, history had a sister with breast cancer and then a sister with both ovarian cancer and colon cancer. So this is very typical of a family with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And then, you know, there was a lot of discussions amongst, uh, you know, the people doing the tumor sequencing, you know, talking to people who do germline work. And, you know, we were saying this should not be that surprising because there was very good evidence in uh, family data that, that BRCA2 mutations increase the risk of prostate cancer in young men by sevenfold. So this is data from about 2000, 2001, from the Breast Cancer Lincoln, Linkage Consortium, where they had lots and lots of families with uh, mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2, and they looked to see what other cancers were in these pedigrees. And um, prostate cancer has always been described as being important um, in uh, men uh, who have a BRCA2 germline mutation. Moreover, um, there's also, there was also data, uh, historic data in the literature saying that men with BRCA2 mutations have worse prostate cancer outcomes. So um, if you go and look at the data from Iceland, uh, people in Iceland um, have uh, share a BRCA2 uh, truncating mutation, the 999-5 mutation. It's present in about 6.6% of the population. Men who have that mutation get early onset prostate cancer. And this is a survival analysis, Kaplan-Meier curve, showing that men with a BRCA2 mutation um, do significantly worse than men without the mutation in Iceland. So this is a population isolate where um, there's a lot of shared environments. So it really gives you more evidence that this single uh, gene mutation is really driving uh, poor outcomes in these patients. Um, if you go back and look in the literature historically, as I said, there's very good evidence that BRCA2 increases the risk of prostate cancer. The data around BRCA1 is not as compelling if you look at the family history data. And there's mixed data about the Lynch syndrome genes, the, the mismatch repair genes. Um, I was fortunate over many years at Michigan to have a lot of um, medical students and um, public health students come and rotate through our lab. And um, we had also had a lot of genetic counselors who did a lot of pedigree construction for us. And um, it's always interesting as we're getting family history information about prostate cancer, 
they, you know, they come over and some of the counselors are like, Dr. Cooney, this, I think this family has colorect, you know, it's too much colorectal cancer. This looks like Lynch syndrome. So we did several projects over the years looking at families with too much colon cancer in addition to prostate cancer. Um, and this is the type of project we would do. So this is a family that um, actually cared for the patient. You can see the little arrow in the pedigree, um, a gentleman with very, very early onset prostate cancer, and he had a, a, a MSH2 germline mutation. You see the family history is very typical for Lynch syndrome. Um, the story of this patient is he was getting, you know, his usual workup for you know, potential cancers related to Lynch syndrome, and by mistake, somebody ordered a PSA, and his PSA was 130, and uh, the patient went on and had a prostatectomy um, because he was young and, and it actually postoperatively had a relatively low PSA. Um, what's interesting is we were able to access the tumor and um, you can see normal prostate, uh, this is a, looking for uh, microsatellite instability. Without getting into a lot of details, the top pattern is normal. You can see as a lot of um, instability, a lot of different bands on the bottom slide. And then we did, um, we worked with Steve Thibodeau at Mayo Clinic and did immunostaining. And you can see there's loss of MH, MSH2 and MSH6, which is typical of uh, cancer arising in an individual with an MSH2 mutation. So um, I think even early on, this is back, you know, 10 years ago, we were starting to believe that um, Lynch syndrome mutations may contribute to prostate cancer. So back, go back, now we're going to back up to talk about tumors. So um, again, these are sort of a convergence, the germline people and the tumor people kind of coming together and looking at our, looking at what we were observing. So this is a paper published by Rule Chenayan's group at Michigan, um, with, which we contributed to. There were, we looked at 150 metastatic prostate cancer cases and tried to sum up what we were seeing in terms of the, the tumor uh, molecular landscape. And what was interesting is 23% of tumors had DNA repair gene mutations. And if you look more closely, 8% of those were germline and 5% of those were in BRCA2. This led a number of people in the prostate cancer world to put together a much larger data set. This paper was led by Colin Pritchard at uh, uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. They had 692 men with metastatic prostate cancer from seven centers and they sequenced 20 DNA repair genes. The overall mutation rate was almost 12%. Um, and this was a major, major finding in our field. And you can see how BRCA2 really dominated the, um, the, the, dominates the landscape. ATM is a little bit, ATM check two are a little less, you know, maybe half of that. And then BRCA1, and then you see what's called the tail of the curve, individual mutations on a number of other DNA repair genes. Strikingly, the family histories are quite different in these individuals. So this is the pedigree on the, on the right is more like a Hox B13 family with multiple cases of prostate cancer. On the left is more typical of what you see with families um, with DNA repair gene mutations where you see a, a host of different cancers in addition to prostate cancer. Uh, to emphasize um, some of the differences in the mutation frequency, when I was at Utah, I worked with our medical oncology group, and uh, we were fortunate again to have banked a bunch of germline DNA samples in men with metastatic prostate cancer. So our laboratory did the next generation sequencing for this project, and um, we found a lower uh, uh, pathogenic mutation rate, it was 8.5% compared to the 12 that had been reported. Um, and if you remove HOXB13, it was really more like 7%. So I think one of the important things about um, the, all of this work is that we need more diverse populations to really understand uh, what the mutation rates are, particularly if we're using these for either research studies or for treatment options. So the rates lower. And um, some of this is that I think many of you know in the audience that um, there are Ashkenazi founder mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Because of the population of Utah, there were no Ashkenazi founder mutations in our study. So it's really important to understand your populations when you're designing trials or things because the mutation rates are different depending on the underlying uh, genetics of the population. So um, I'm gonna wrap up and talk about clinical implications of this work. So there's, uh, the NCCN is the guiding body for um, oncology. The NCCN is a, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and it's comprised of leadership from ma many major cancer centers, including WashU. And the panels get together and make recommendations for how we both screen, manage, and treat cancer. And these bodies meet frequently, they review the literature, and then the, these decisions are often used by pharma and industry around funding and around what 
what you know what will get covered or paid for. Um, as it relates to um, prostate cancer genetics or germline genetics, there's two areas to focus on. One is men in high risk families. So these are men that have a strong family history of prostate cancer or they are members of a family with a known cancer syndrome. So either you can tell the, what the cancer syndrome is by the types of cancers in the family, or you know that the family carries, a, you know, for perhaps a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. These individuals should be referred to a cancer genetics clinic. They should have the appropriate uh, molecular testing, um, again, guided by their insurance coverage. They're, right now, if you look at almost all of the genetic um, companies have a cancer susceptibility panel. Some of them are targeted for prostate cancer, others aren't. And um, I have a slide, which I did not include, which just shows you all the different companies and what they test for. So our genetic counselors do spend a fair amount of time trying to understand what the patient has, what tests should be performed and how to get that test covered. Um, there are companies that will do now uh, testing for prostate cancer for free, um, but patients have to agree to have their data then released into a large data set. And so that's been um, somewhat controversial. Um, there's a lot of uh, concern about what to do now. So if you have a, a patient um, who is an unaffected male with a germline uh, mutation that increases the risk of prostate cancer, what should you do and what should you do differently? So many um, institutions are setting up uh, testing programs. Um, there's biopositories being generated to help um, maybe come up with better tests other than PSA for prostate cancer. And then um, in the urologic community and radiology, there's been a lot of work done on better MRIs uh, to try to do uh, better um, imaging to detect early prostate cancer lesions. So here's some new evidence that this might actually work. Um, so this is a paper that was published in Lancet Oncology last year. Um, this is a large international study called IMPACT led by Raziels and her group at, in the UK. Um, they originally did a study looking to see if you could test men with BRCA1 and 2 mutations to see um, if you screen them with PSA, could you find more prostate cancers? And that data is a little bit um, uh, not as strong as this data. So I thought I'd show this one. This is a their second study, which um, we participated in at Michigan and also at Utah, where we um, a number of groups contributed information around um, working with men who had a known BR, or known MMR microsatellite or mismatch repair gene mutation. And they focused um, specifically on MSH2, MSH6, and MLH1, which I did not show um, because it, there, it, there was a, less, a lower mutation rate and the data is not as compelling. In this uh, program, men had to be between the ages of 40 and 69. They had, could not have had cancer or prostate cancer, um, but it was okay if they had been screened previously. And this data I'm showing is from the, the beginning of the study, their first screening. So um, they used a PSA cutoff of 3.0. So if you were above three, it was recommended that you went on to have a prostate biopsy. Um, the follow-up on the biopsy was not particularly great. It's about half the men with ele elevated PSAs went on for biopsy. Despite that, there's pretty compelling data in this relatively small, I would say somewhat early study about whether screening men at genetic risk can actually increase the risk of, of finding disease earlier and treating at, a, at an earlier time point. So what you can see in the screening study is the mutation carriers for MSH2, 4.3% were found to have prostate cancer. Um, the non-carriers from those same families, so men in the same pedigrees without the mutation, was much lower, and, and then that's a significant uh, difference. Same with um, MSH6. And if you go back and you read the details of the paper, the cancers that were found in these men seemed to be of higher grade. Some were metastatic at the time of diagnosis. So really some interesting, uh, but very preliminary data that, that finding men with germline mutations and screening them for prostate cancer may be very important for them, for their family members um, in particular. So um, right now, the, back to the NCTN guidelines, the second major category are um, the, the groups recommend both tumor and germline testing for prostate cancer genes in men with metastatic disease, and then cascade testing for family members. So if you find you know, a BRCA2 mutation, calling the family members in for cascade testing. The important thing here is that there are implications for treatment. So for, for the oncologists in the audience, I think many people know that PARP inhibition works particularly well in men with DNA repair gene mutations, just like in ovarian cancer and other diseases. And lots of studies going on with PARP inhibition uh, trials, when to treat, should we treat earlier, et cetera. 
Similarly, um, the immune checkpoint inhibition drugs in general do not work for prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is sort of immuno cold. Um, and, uh, but what's interesting in, is uh, men with microstatolite instability have more mutations and make a more immune active uh, tumor. And there's fairly good evidence that checkpoint inhibition may work for these individuals. So this goes on beyond just trying to find cancer earlier, but may um, have important implications for treatment. Lots of people are working in this area. So it's, it's nice to see now articles coming out in the clinical literature. This is um, from, uh, this is a more clinically oriented paper trying to help get out to people working in prostate cancer, kind of what is the data showing? So, you know, here's a whole list of DNA uh, repair genes. You know, what's the prevalence of mutations in metastatic cancer? This middle study is a study uh, looking at, I think it was from Invite, where they tested a whole lot of people. So it's sort of more of a generic group of uh, you know, patients, some with um, advanced prostate cancer, some were suspected of it, but not necessarily having it. And then helping decide if you're in the community and you're trying to think about, well, what do I do with that patient showing? Where is the evidence in terms of uh, treatment benefit? So again, really good work trying to pull together very complex information. Um, I like to encourage people. I, I actually worked, did a resident uh, morning report the other day and it was a cancer case and, and asked it, how many of our residents use the NCCN to get information on cancer? And I think one person raised their hands. So I'd encourage all of you, if you're not an oncologist, this is all free information. You just have to set up an account and then you can have access to all of this. And it's really helpful. Sometimes it's overwhelming, but, it, you know, but the, the front end of each disease has a section that um, will help you find, you know, what to do by stage by grade. And there's also very good uh, genetic data, for, which is what I'm showing you here. And it gets updated at least every year, if not more frequently. Um, and I think provides really good guidance if you're um, not sure what to do. So um, in closing, I hope I've been able to convince you that uh, genetics is important in prostate cancer. And we've been able to use a combination of approaches to find prostate cancer risk genes, both through family studies, as well as tumor sequencing. I think we have a number of challenges still. One, we need better data from diverse populations. Many of the studies, particularly the studies of advanced prostate cancer, largely have white men um, because that's who comes to the comprehensive cancer center. So um, I'm quite proud of the work of one of my former trainees, Vivi Geary, who works at uh, Jefferson's Cancer Center in Philadelphia, really trying to understand the differences of, um, in, the, in the genetic backgrounds um, because I think it's gonna be really important as we move some of this into clinical um, implementation. Um, the next issue is about genetic testing. So um, prostate cancer is a disease management generally by urologists, um, and um, they tend to like to do things like kind of quickly. And so there have been a lot of uh, push um, in the urologic community about doing like large scale genetic testing. This is a big burden to clinics and it really has to be done well. And so many clinics are now trying to just test if the tests are negative, patients are told that. If tests are positive, they send the patient to genetic counseling. That works if your system is good. If the system is has gaps, that, that can uh, be problematic. Um, but we simply don't have enough genetic providers to, to provide all this uh, management up front. So the clinicians have to be involved in this. And then um, I talked briefly about prostate cancer screening for high-risk men. This is a really another active area. Um, really, you know, when should we screen? Um, uh, when I set up a, a prostate cancer screening program with one of the urologists at Utah, and we had a 29-year-old come in who knew he carried a PALB2 mutation, you know, and we had sort of said 35 and above. This patient was really anxious about it, 29, because he had a lot of family history of cancer in his family. So a lot of discussions that need to go on about when to screen, when to start, what age to start, what PSA cutoff should be used. So um, in closing, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I have to acknowledge all the many people and many institutions who've contributed to this work, including our Duke uh, Department of Medicine, DCI, the University of Utah, and the Huntsman Cancer Institute, um, many years at the University of Michigan, and then my close collaborators, Bill Isaacs, Jin Feng Zhu, J Jennifer Beebe Dimmer, and Veda Geary, and funding from the DOD and the NIH. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Penny. Oh, we can certainly, if anybody in the audience has any questions or questions for you. Yes. So is HOXB13 a tumor suppressor of either familial uh, prostate cancer or spontaneous prostate cancer? Um, the answer to that is not known yet, and it's a great question. So um, you would think 
it, there's data to say both, right? So if you look at the old data, there's evidence that it's a tumor suppressor as a gene, like people had done studies back in breast cancer and prostate cancer thinking that it's a tumor suppressor. The fact that it's a recurrent mutation and not a, um, that, that doesn't inactivate the protein makes you think it could be an oncogene. When I was at Michigan, we uh, collaborated with some people and did some brute force <laughs> biochemistry to try to see what those mutations are doing, looking at DNA binding and other, and it was did not helpful. Um, there is a lot of work now trying to understand the, ch the changes in transcriptional activity. Be if you look at, there is a knockout mice, it didn't get into a lot of the um, science um, today. There is a knockout mouse that um, basically shows the, the prostate gland looks different, um, but is not cancer. And it's interesting, the mouse has, because of what the, the gene does in development, the mouse has a weird tail. <laughs> so um, so it shows that there's biologic activity. If you take the gene out, the mouse is alive, it's not a lethal. Um, so it's, it's a very active area still of investigation, um, both at Duke and at other places. Thank you. Yes. Do you see an avenue potentially in the future, beginning in the primary care setting where patients with a strong family history of these cancers um, can be sent for genetic testing, which can then guide the, that shared decision-making for PSA screening? So um, I'm gonna add, remember to say the question. So the question is, um, what is the um, opportunity for genetic testing and uh, understanding family history and doing genetic testing much earlier, doing it in the primary care setting? So it's a great question. I think it's, um, it, it is the, um, I think the future. Um, so if you've ever listened to Mary Claire King talk about breast cancer, she has a very strong case of a paper she published, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, kind of a, a thought paper about, you know, should we test all women for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations at, you know, before 30 or something? Um, and really trying to convince people that that's the right thing to do because the importance of that mutation to that individual is so strong um, and doing it early is, is more effective at a population level. Um, I think it's the way to go. Um, I, there, I had the opportunity of visiting um, a going to Israel, actually the year I went to Duke. And um, it, it's very interesting there. They're trying to put together clinics that's like genetically guided primary care and, and like versus standard of care, where they train the, the providers and the staff to take family histories and then start to um, test for things that we, now we should be testing for. So uh, FH, you know, familial hypercholesterolemia and BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, and then get the clinics to embrace that versus standard of care. So I do think that's the right way to go, and which is why I uh, threw in my family history study, because I do think that in, you know, from I've spent, oh, uh, my husband is a urologist by all disclosure. So I have been to a lot of urology meetings and I've done a lot of uh, interactions around PSA. And I know, I know all the problems with PSA and I know why it has kind of the bad rap that it does. And I know why people don't like to take a family history. When we first started this work, we would get, you know, the clinic charts on patients and family history, non-contributory, family history, not available. And so, you know, we would send undergraduates into the clinics and start collecting family history. The family history was often very, it was there. It just took time to ascertain it. So I think if we're going to do this, we'd have to structure clinics very differently. We'd have to, um, we have a, um, one of the, the faculty at, at Duke uh, created a program called Mitri, which is a way that you can, a lot of, pro, there's lots of programs being developed where you can get people to fill out their family history on their own time and then bring it in um, and make it more. But I think, I think we have to own all of this as a medical care because we don't just like in many areas of medicine we don't have enough specialists we don't these all these people you know if you right now there's recommendations in pancreas cancer in prostate cancer um for uh, doing um germline testing for all of patients because of the high you know 10 percent frequency of dna repair gene mutations that's a lot a burden on the, on the cancer you know of people and, and oftentimes when you're working with someone who's got advanced cancer it's sometimes a distract. It's hard. It's hard to balance that conversation of what well, we're going to find. We need to find this mutation for you because it impacts your disease, but we also want to share it with your family. It's just a, it's a lot. So I think moving it earlier would be a good thing to do, but it's be a big change on how we practice medicine. It's a great question. Right. Um, well, I would say we, I through the chat at the moment. So with that, I guess I will say Great. thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the Levin family for uh, the generous contribution again.
And thank you, Dr. Cooney, for your time. Thank you very much.